Hey audiophiles, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. I know I start almost every video with the same sentence. Today I've got something really special for you. And it's getting old. I caught myself saying it just too many times. So here's the problem. This is something, in fact, pretty special. I've never had a set of BMW Nautiluses before. And I finally have the privilege of uh, playing with a pair after admiring them for uh, several decades. This is the flagship from Bowers & Wilkins. This is the model that launched the entire Nautilus series, which is arguably one of the most successful speaker series ever made by anybody, really. The 801s, 802s, 803s, all the way to 5s have been a staple of, of, every, uh, of just about every audiophile. If you are a series audiophile, at some point you've had a set of Nautilus speakers. And this was the predecessor to all of them. Um, it was designed in the... Uh, mid-90s, you know, prototypes appeared in 92, 93, and finally somewhere in the mid-90s it went into production. And it was a tour de force of, uh, of speaker design. I mean, look at these things. They're absolutely marvelous. They're as much art as they are engineering. And, uh, and what's interesting is that, you know, they looked at all the cabinet designs and placements and configurations, and they resorted to nature to kind of nail it. <laughs> They resorted, resorted to the, uh, the, the Nautilus shell um, to create this iconic shape from Bowers and Wilkins. So today I'm going to dive in, tell you a bit about its design, how it was constructed, what it's like to have a pair, how to connect them, and so on and so forth. So um, if you hang out for a while, you, you're going to learn everything you need to know about the Nautilus. And before we go a lot further, if you like the videos and you enjoy our channel, please subscribe and make sure you like our, our channel. It keeps us uh, motivated and it keeps us engaged so that we uh, take the effort to make these videos for you. So I'm going to jump in. So Nautilus, uh, original Nautilus speaker from, from the 1990s. Um, the concept was simple. Um, first of all, to create a speaker that had minimal impact from the cabinet. Right, and, uh, and you've seen this this song before, or you've heard it before. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, creating as as thin of a cabinet as you can, so that the drivers is all you hear, and and that's what happened here. They tried a bunch of different designs, designs resorted to the Nautilus shape, and uh, this is what we got: a four-way speaker seamlessly integrated between the drivers and the cabinets. You'll notice a few things, and I've got them sort of arranged differently so you can see both the front profile and the side profile at the same time. They have these um, tube structures behind each driver. So over here, the tweeter has a small um, tube coming out of the back of it, and it is designed in volume and length to match the frequency of the tweeter, and same for the upper mid-range and the lower mid-range. That's what th these other drivers are. Um, here is the, the tweeter, the upper mid-range, the lower mid-range, and the bass driver. So they are in varying lengths. Um, now, to have the proper cavity volume for the woofer, which is here, this would have had to have been, had a tube of almost three meters in length coming out the back, which would have been a bit difficult uh, and unsightly. So they decided on a folded horn type of design. It's really a snail, uh, hence the reference to the nature of things. So um, this cavity, if you were to lay it out and unroll it like a cinnamon bun, you would end up with about three meters worth of cabinet, which is really neat. This iconic design is in museums. Uh, it's graced the cover of just about every magazine. Um, and what's really neat is that um, even though it was made in the mid-90s, it's still being manufactured today. You can still buy a set of Nautiluses from Bowers & Wilkins if you are the most patient audiophile in the world. Uh, construction these days due to manufacturing restraints, COVID and the likes has been, I think lead time right now, last time I checked was uh, under two years, but definitely more than 12 months. And most audiophiles aren't willing to wait. So let me give you a couple of other views. I try to place the camera down as much as possible because people will often remind me uh, not to shake it too much. So give you a close up of the tube and really the complex curves. Uh, I mean, look at this complex curve here um, through the three drivers. 
It's absolutely beautiful. And it's a side of the, the tubes behind. So the plinth that you see is actually made out of marble. It has a bit of a curve or a concave shape in it where the Nautilus snail sits in and a single post with a threaded brass insert holds the entire speaker to the base. So it's very delicate. These are finished in um, midnight blue. There are three standard colors available from Bowers and Wilkins. I believe it is uh, silver, black, and midnight blue. This is by far the prettiest. But guess what? If you are patient and are willing to work with Bowers and Wilkins, you can actually have them made in any color that you want. You can supply a Panatone color chart and they will do whatever you want. So if you've got a favorite Ferrari or, or vintage Maserati that you want to match the paint color to for your man cave, this is the brand that'll do it for you. This midnight blue is absolutely beautiful. It reminds me of a Porsche blue that's been around for decades. It's got a tiny bit of purple in it and a, quite a bit of blue. All right, let me keep going in a bit more deeper in here. So 12 inch drivers uh, for the woofers and I'm not quite sure what size the lower mid range is. Looks to be about a four inch, then maybe two and a half inches and then about a one inch tweeter. And the thing that's notable is you'll find that the material for all three drivers is aluminum. And it was an important part of the design concept is that in order to minimize the transition between the different frequencies, uh, the designers resorted to the exact same material for all three, which is super rare. I don't remember seeing a speaker uh, where the same material is used on all three drivers. So that's a big part of the, the design intent. The other thing that's unusual about these speakers is the way they're connected. Um, they're not conventional in the sense where there's no crossover internally to the speaker. The crossover is, is active and it's external. What does that mean is that we have essentially a captive power cord, I'm sorry, speaker wire coming out of the speaker and in it are four sets of conductors, one for each driver. So there's actually no internal crossover to say the crossover is actually sits between your amplifier and your preamplifier. So each of this is, uh, let's see, we've got a bass, we've got a tweeter, upper mid and lower mid. So these wires are captive. I know on some of the speakers, these were silver. I know on their silver signature, uh, I don't think they are in the, in the Bowers, but it's a definitely a very high quality cable. I'm not sure who the manufacturer is. But anyway, they come in this specific length, which is about uh, eight or 10 feet. So if you need to move further away, you're probably violating some design intent. So bases are made out of marble, I said, very heavy, probably 100 pounds or maybe a little less per base. And their speakers aren't that heavy. Um, they are constructed of, uh, I believe, uh, uh, fiberglass and it is molded into two halves. So if you take the speaker and you slice it down the middle, uh, the mold is essentially put together and meticulously um, reworked so that there are no seams or anything showing. So it's really just a mastery of bodywork, um, like they do with cars, with vintage cars. So imagine this uh, being sliced down the middle into two half shells and then joined together. So there are no seams or transition marks. The, the finish is absolutely flawless. Um, now these aren't sort of what I would call workhorse speakers. The workhorses in their lineup would be the 801s or the 802s. Those are really meant for studio use and for high-end residences. This is a more of a, an exotic and delicate piece. They're incredible, dif incredibly difficult to move around without damaging them. There are no grills or anything protecting these tweeters which are mid-ranges, which are incredibly delicate. Uh, pretty much a one and a half to two pound push right here destroys a very expensive mid-range. Same for the tweeter. Uh, the lower mid-range is a little more resilient, but the woofer is, is equally delicate, especially in the dust cap. 
So very delicate to move around. They're not made out of wood, so if you bang them or dent them, it's uh, it's over, game over. You have to probably hire a body shop in order to put these back together, or do any repairs. Very high gloss finish uh, throughout. I believe they even uh, read somewhere that they use around 12 coats of uh, lacquer. Uh, that's what you would find in an exotic car at this point between the, the paint and the lacquer, totaling 12 coats. It's pretty crazy. All right, so um, another interesting fact is because the crossovers, uh, the, the, since the crossover is external, the they are actually the drivers are matched to their crossover frequency. So um, you cannot simply just replace the driver. You've got to then make modifications to the crossover because they're mated at the factory, depending on how the cro the, the driver measures. So, and I'm going to show you what the crossovers look like now. I've got them laid out here. So it's um, they're mono design. So there are two crossovers. You have John Bauer's signature line. So single power light in the front, and if we go around the back, you kind of get a sense of what we need. Um, there's a total of uh, eight amplification channels needed to power these babies. So in a s typical pair of speakers, you need two channels. Because the crossovers are in fact active, we need eight channels. So either four stereo pairs or eight single mono amplifiers will be required. And you can present them in either single-ended or XLRs, as you can see here. Let me get a better light here. Okay. So line in is on the left. You can see the top box is all white uh, trim surrounds, and the bottom is red, so left and right. You got the inputs on the left. Then you got the low frequency, the lower mid frequency, the upper mid frequency, and then the high frequencies, so from low to high, essentially. And then the power connections. Seems to be like a high quality uh, crossover. It almost reminds me of the, the Krell pieces. I uh, see a toroidal transformer in there. See a high quality epoxy boards. So I suspect this is very well made. My colleague told me that if you damage or lose one of these, the price is pretty astronomical for a single unit. Um, so, because they are in production, the beauty is that if you do break a driver, that they're still available. They are expensive, but there are drivers available. So unlike most exotic vintage speakers where you're out of luck, Bowers is still producing the drivers. I'm sure they have a long lead time, but they are available, so it wouldn't be the end of the world. So, um, as I mentioned, this sits between the uh, amp and the preamp, essentially, as an active crossover. So. The output from your preamp would go to these units, and then the output from these units would go to your amplifiers, and then over to the speakers. And that's a good shot at the cables that go with it. Um, in terms of sound quality, so I heard these a long time ago. This particular set just arrived. I was so excited to share it with you that I haven't even plugged them in yet. But I've heard these before. I went to Bowers and Wilkins training up in Massachusetts with my colleague many, many years ago. and. We were treated to a dedicated listening room experience with these speakers. Now online they talk about how big of a sound stage they throw. And they do in fact throw a pretty impressive sound stage, probably because of the lack of a cabinet. But I did find that they had a fairly narrow sweet spot. They had one chair set up with a bunch of amplifiers and these speakers about 10, 11 feet apart. And if you moved your head too far left or too far right, a lot of the sound stage went away. Now, they were still incredibly impressive off-field and very dynamic, very powerful sound, as you can imagine from a single 12-inch uh, woofer uh, being driven by eight channels. So uh, a wonderful sounding speaker and really the, the top of, uh, and still relevant by today's standards. I know speaker designs have come a long way. Bowers and Wilkins has revised the aluminum tweeter now probably half a dozen times into different iterations of the diamond tweeter but uh, these are still being produced today with aluminum tweeters. So how come they haven't upgraded these to diamond tweeters? Well, as I said before, the designer wanted the exact same material in all four drivers to reduce uh, or to improve the, the crossover or the, the transition between woofers and, and tweeters and mid-ranges. So changing the material in one essentially would be contradicted the, the original design intent. 
so they've stayed true to the original design and they're still being sold all over the world um, let me see my notes see if I missed anything else all right the designer was Lawrence Dickey um, and uh, as I mentioned it was inspired by nature um, a oh, price. So these speakers, I think, retail today around fifty-seven to sixty thousand pounds. So quite a bit of money. But now that speakers are two, three, four hundred thousand dollars, I guess these are still somewhat in the uh, reasonable realm. Uh, they're made in, in Worthing, England, um, and um, I think that covers about most of it. Um, so this is, in fact, SkyFi Audio from Glen Rock, New Jersey. I've really enjoyed sharing these with you. I'm going to do another video actually playing the speakers. I don't know if you've, you've noticed, but we recently introduced Hal. Hal is our binaural buddy. Um, he's sitting right here listening to a Macintosh JID system. Uh, this is Hal. We're going to set him up in the sweet spot so we can kind of share with you what a Nautilus speaker sounds like. He's got microphones in his ears. He's got a camera mount in the back. And uh, his ears are made out of uh, some soft, creepy material that we don't know what it is yet. So we'll set them up in front of the Nautiluses and bring you some music in the next video. And uh, please visit our website. You'll see lots of, lots of gear. I'm talking hundreds of items, uh, including these MBLs that we're restoring, tons of turntables. Here's a Lin LP12, some Macintosh line array speakers, or Macintosh wall of sound. Um, our recent uh, what's up in the lift today? Well, that's a, a 98 M3 four-door sedan, referred to as an M345. M3 for the name, uh, four for the number of doors, and five for M345. Wow, I can't even remember right now. Let me show you the rest of the shop. A lot of equipment coming and going. Uh, Here's the things we're processing now. Our lab is back there, just to give you a sneak peek. And that's it. So again, Fernando from SkyFi Audio. Our website is skyfiaudio.com, um, where you can purchase things online. And uh, thanks for watching, and please be sure to subscribe.